today on CityCast Denver. Colorado confirmed Tuesday what we've known for a while. We're pretty blue. We know this is on your mind because it's on ours. Is there a result you were surprised by, like Grandstander-in-Chief Lauren Boebert possibly, hopefully, maybe losing to some city councilman from Aspen? I mean, frish who? Were Denverites saying no to eviction defense? And the caraveo kirkmeyer race up north that's still too close to call? We're talking to Westward editor Patty Calhoun tomorrow, and we want to know what matters to you. Leave us a voicemail with your name and neighborhood, and we might play it on the show. That number is 720-500-5418. And in case you forget, the number is always in the show notes of every episode. That's 720-500-5418. But while the dust settles, dear listeners, this one is for you. Today, my producer Paul Caroli and I will be reading and responding to your thoughts, critiques, and recommendations. Today is Thursday, November 10th. I'm Bree Davies, and this is a CityCast Denver mailbag episode. We're going to talk about three different topics from three different episodes that we've done in the last couple of weeks that you all were really interested in and, and shared a lot with us about. Um, one is the best coffee shops conversation. Hugely divisive, apparently. <laughs> Very divisive <laughs> among our listeners, um, which was cool because we got a lot of really good recommendations and ways to think about coffee next time you go into a coffee shop. Um, we're also going to talk about tipping. We have done two episodes on this now, Paul. Mm-hmm. This will be our third. It was It was very... A lot of folks had a lot of things to say about it. Um, and then the last topic is water. And we had some really helpful feedback from someone who like works in the world of water. So I'm excited to share that. But we're going to start with coffee. We got a voicemail from a listener named Nate Evans, and we're going to share that right now. Hey, CityCast Denver team. This is Nate from Indian Creek again. Love the show. Rarely miss one. Really appreciate all your coverage. I wanted to leave a quick voicemail about the coffee episode from a week or two ago. It elicited quite a lot of opinions in my household um, from myself, who's a big coffee fan and coffee nerd, and my wife, who was a barista for a long time. I have to uh, agree with the barista from Thump, uh, who gave that reaction to Paul uh, about the the coffee taste being sour. Uh, that'd be like equivalent to uh, calling a light roast coffee sour is like equivalent to labeling all IPAs as bitter or dark beers as too heavy. Uh, the, the coffee scene in Denver actually is, is really incredible. Uh, I myself have been over to 90 different shops, and I always tell people Denver is the best in the nation in coffee and beer. And uh, I did agree with Hey Denver's top 10 uh, newsletter, which basically matched the top 10 that I have. Um, you could not go wrong with Sweet Bloom, Middle State, Corvus, Little Owl, and Huckleberry. Um, I'd put those toe to toe with any coffee shop in the nation. Um, they're doing some really innovative stuff with ethical sourcing. Uh, take pride in what they do, and uh, I'd love it if you could do a a week on coffee like you did for for pizza. But love what you guys do. Just wanted to throw my my opinions in the ring about coffee and how awesome of a coffee city Denver is. All right, thanks. Bye. Paul. Wow. <laughs> Nate loves his coffee. And I love that. Respect. Honestly, I, I learned a lot from Nate. I mean, in addition to the to the voicemail, he also and his wife, Marie, sent a couple of emails, quite long, detailed, thorough emails describing their uh, research into the local coffee community. And it is super impressive, like more than 90 shops. They've divided these things into all sorts of different categories, breaking down their experiences in different ways. I don't know. I, I've got, um, I want to revisit some of my old favorites and try some of these new places with the new, a new perspective, I think. Bree, do you know any of those? Do you have any experience with those places that he shouted out as his favorites? Um, I think it was like Huckleberry, Corvus, Sweet Bloom. Yeah. So I got a, when we, um, we had a sponsor trade coffee, they sent me a bag of Huckleberry Roasters coffee and it was delicious. I also filled out like a quiz. So my flavor profiles from Huckleberry were probably very specific to the kind of coffee I'm used to, which is something that 
Nate and his wife both touch on with the thump coffee experience that we have that we we didn't understand that it was supposed to be sour or we are mischaracter. I ha- look. I have to be honest. That's with you. still a very loaded situation. There's a lot I, to unpack yeah. still. Yes. For listeners who aren't familiar, the 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 story in question from that episode was me talking about an experience I had going into Thump in Capitol Hill, getting a cup of coffee like I had many times, taking a sip, tasting lots of sourness, and then asking the barista, hey, I mean, can I have a different cup that's a little less sour? And the barista acting as if I was an alien, as if I had really hurt his feelings. And there there was like, there, it shouldn't be sour. This isn't sour. What are you even talking about? Just the total mismatch, miscommunication, and mis you know, different expectations of what coffee should be. And that's, that's what I liked most about these uh, emails from Nate and Marie was the context on why that miscommunication happened. Mm-hmm. Bree, did you have anything, mm-hmm. any thoughts about this whole, like why some, why coffee is sour as, as Marie described uh, it or why different people think of it as sour and not sour? She shared this link about a, a story called why is, why is hipster coffee sour? And um, it's about the types of beans that are used and how they're roasted. So lightly roasted coffee has a more complex flavor as it preserves a good portion of the acids found in coffee beans. So maybe that's the sour part. Mm -hmm. I I mean, honestly, the reaction from the barista to me feels like when I was a teenager going into a record store and I had to ask an employee for a record that they clearly thought was not cool. And they looked at me like I should go die. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of what I thought happened to you. Separately, my experience at Thump was like they were just rude. You know why I love Starbucks? They're nice to me. They don't make me feel stupid. They don't talk down to me. They're nice. How's your day going? It's great. How's yours? Hey, thanks. Have a good day. Not, well, here's your coffee, whatever this weird order is. You know what I mean? Like, I just I just don't buy it. I buy I buy the sourness. That is fair. That that we're mischaracterizing it because we don't understand or know our palates don't get it. But I it does not excuse someone being rude. Yeah. But the fact that the sourness is something that some people like really pursue and desire or like see nuance in different types of coffee that's prepared in that way, that was kind of interesting. Like, I don't know. I, I'm curious to explore that a little more, try to appreciate that. Sounds sure. like there's a lot of nuance there. And there's a lot of places that they recommended, which I thought was really helpful. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to go back to the place where they were rude, but Middle State is right on Santa Fe. Um, was it Sweet Bloom? A lot of, I feel like we got a, a couple re- recommendations mm-hmm. for that spot. So mm-hmm. there's a couple of different places you could try and come back and report report your findings, Paul. Yeah. Corvus on South Broadway. I have been there and I do like mm. that place. I think I've only ever had espresso drinks there. So I can't speak to their their coffee, but I have enjoyed hanging out there. Yeah. I want to read this next one from a listener who's got a kind of a conspiracy theory about the Starbucks unionization efforts or Ooh. what's going transpiring with them. And like, I kind of love what he said. Excellent. This is from Blake Etherton. And he said, this is just an extrapolation from observation. As you know, Starbucks is union busting left and right. And part of that is shutting down stores left and right. But another thing they've been doing is shutting down stores that aren't even unionizing yet, but are still profitable. I know a couple of these situations as we've been approached by buildings looking to fill vacating Starbucks spaces. My hypothesis is that they are preemptively shutting down a store to create a labor surplus for themselves. It makes unionizing much more difficult when you create competition amongst your workers for hours. Hmm. I don't know. I'm kind of on Blake's side. I could feel this conspiracy theory being legit. Yeah, I think where it clicks for me is the fact that there's just so many Starbucks. Like, yes. So if you if your store gets shut down... Then the people who work there, like if you're a barista, you know, on, on the 16th street mall, then it would be conceivable that you might want to continue your job at Starbucks and you would have another one that's convenient enough for you to work there. So that would be more competition between you and whoever's already working at that other shop. Yeah. I I think Blake's onto something. We'll be, we'll be watching. It's interesting. Okay, so here's here's another message from a listener on the coffee conversation. This one is from Steve Marsh. He writes, love the show. I moved here about a year ago, and this podcast has been a great way to plug into local news, tips, and issues. However, the <laughs> coffee episode today was a miss. The lack of promoting or talking about local coffee shops and locally roasted coffee was disappointing. Plus, y'all had a whole section dedicated to Starbucks. Come on. <laughs> 
First of all, Steve, give a lot of love to Boyer's local roaster. Just have to say that. Boyer's my favorite coffee. Um, So Steve goes on. With that said, I know y'all are also a different generation of coffee drinkers. Because of your Mm. love of Starbucks, I assume you like the medium to dark roast coffees, which taste burnt to me. Uh, You mentioned one coffee. Okay, so he's talking about the thump thing as well, um, which I think we addressed. But thank you for your comments, Steve. Um, appreciate, Appreciate the thoughtful feedback. Um, But Steve also said that our coffee scene is so great that we have companies here that are distributing their beans across the country. Uh, Sweet Blue, Middle State, Huckleberry, and Queen City. Steve also says, more expensive per bag, yes, and the shops have a hipster vibe to them, but the coffee is high quality and delicious. Okay, fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Respect. I respect the coffee scene. It's not my scene, but doesn't mean I can't support it. This episode is brought to you by the Denver Film Festival, which is happening right now, and it's running through November 13th. It's the largest film festival in the Rocky Mountain region, and it's back for its 45th year. The Denver Film Festival has a killer slate of movies this year, too. I'm talking about the new Sam Mendes flick, Empire of Light, Darren Aronofsky's The Whale, which I'm told was huge at Cannes, and red carpets, special events, special guests, and so much more. Find your new favorite films and choose your own adventure as we explore the stories that stay with you. Denver Film Festival passes and tickets are on sale now at denverfilm.org forward slash learn. Darren Aronofsky's The Whale, which I'm told was huge at at Cannes, damn it. I just want to find 11,780 votes. The Fulton County Grand Jury Investigation of Donald Trump. What proves fact A, fact B, and fact C? If we can do that, I'm going to bring an indictment. I'm Bill Rankin. I'm Tamar Hallerman. Join us for Season 9 of Breakdown from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Listen now, and please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, so Paul, we have have another email from a listener. Yeah. So this one comes to us from Eric Isle. Um, and this is on the subject of tipping, uh, a topic that we've covered a couple of times on the show. We've been talking about it for months now. Real hot topic. Everyone's got an opinion. Um, this is Eric's. He says, long time, first time. I'm no longer a Denver resident, but I still have a soft spot in my cold, dead heart for that messy queen city. Thanks to my past relationship with it. Anyway, I love listening to your podcasts, whether they're going deep and serious or deep and playful, and I've particularly appreciated the couple of episodes on the complex topic of tipping. I think there's a key additional dimension of this topic that you haven't yet explored that I'd love to hear you dig into. As a customer, it seems to me that it's the employer's job to pay its employees, not the customers. But the conversations so far have pretty much focused on what customers do. How can employers take more responsibility for ensuring their employees are making a living instead of making it the responsibility of the customers or the employees themselves? Bree, what do you think about that? I think that's a good question. First of all, hi, Eric. Thanks for listening. I know long time, first time, but I've known you even longer than that. Um, I think he makes a great point. A lot of times it's put in the customer's hands and like it shouldn't be. We're the customer, right? Anecdotally, what I think is happening often is like if you actually put the price of food on the menu, like what it actually costs to run a restaurant and that was reflected in our menus, it would probably be be hard to attract customers, right? Yeah, I mean... Personally, I mean, as a customer, my preference would be for the the total price of the experience and the food to be on the menu when I'm ordering. Like I've always felt that this is kind of a kind of like more of a run of show problem than a economics problem. This whole tipping situation, because it's asking you as the customer to make your decision about what you want to eat with this like artificially deflated price on the menu. And then at the Mm -hmm. end of the meal, it shows up and then you have this, this awkward dance of like, was the service good? Did I get what I ordered? And you have to make your own choices where really it would be much easier to just say at the beginning, like, okay, $24 for this sandwich. That's what I want. I'll have that. And then the whole experience follows. Hmm. But I don't know. It's such a cultural thing too. Like that's not the way yes. Americans eat. At least no. go out to eat. <laughs> no, it's not. And I'm also just thinking about the experience in the restaurant. So if you're paying for everything up front 
and then you have a horrendous time in the restaurant, you're probably going to be like, I'm not going back there for a $24 sandwich. Yeah. I'll go back there for an $18 sandwich. But is that is that appropriate? Should we be making these decisions? No. I think he's right. I think you're right. How that gets implemented, though, I'd be curious to see. I mean, I feel like restaurant owners understand there's a threshold. There's a point at which you can't charge too much or people will just not come in for your, you know, your basic sandwich or whatever. Hmm. It's a struggle. Yeah, I think you had it right, though, earlier when you were saying, like, what's one restaurant supposed to do about it? Like, are you supposed to take the leap and put the real price on the menu and then be like $10 more expensive than your competition? Or so it would appear on the internet on your menu. Like that Uh, would be, it's a horrible prisoner's dilemma kind of situation. Yes. And we watched this happen with a coffee shop. Oh, of course. Yeah. Amethyst. Amethyst. We had the owner, one of the co-owners of Amethyst Coffee Shop, Elle Taylor, on the show. And she did this very thing, right? They raised their prices. They doubled the prices of their coffee so that they could pay their employees a living wage. And that they went out of business. They said the reason was they were burnt out, which I believe. But what frustrated me was the media coverage of it sort of blamed them for raising their prices. Like the headline, I feel like the Denver Post headline was like, coffee shop who raised prices to pay minimum wage goes out of business. So do you want to be that one restaurant? Probably not. It has to be industry-wide if it's going to change. Yeah. One other thing from Eric before we move on. Eric uh, actually recommended an article from the New York Times apparently came out um, recently about this whole tipping situation. And uh, the article mentioned Illegal Pete's, our local Denver-style, Mission-style burrito chain. Apparently, Illegal Pete's is one of those places that has um, increased wages and health benefits for employees. Illegal Pete's had to raise prices to do that. Mm Mm-hmm. But I, again, I think uh, Illegal Pete's has a little bit of leverage here, right? They're a known restaurant name here in Denver. They have multiple locations. He could be setting a precedence or an example for folks. Yeah. But did any, I mean, this was in 2019, so. Yeah, be interesting to hear how that turned out. Well, I, I think we should reach out to a restaurant or to talk about this, because I think, you know, even for an Illegal Pete's with a, with a chain of restaurants, like profit margins are, are slim and it probably felt like a big risk to, to make a decision like this. It sure. probably was a big risk. You never know how customers are going to react. You never know if someone, how many people think your burrito's actually worth $12 instead of the 10 <laughs> they've been paying. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. I agree with you, Paul. Sticker shock is real. Our last topic is water. So a couple of months ago, we did a story about Denver water. Is Denver running out of water? The representative we talked to from Denver Water said, no, we're not. And then we followed that up with an uh, episode asking the question, well, is Denver hoarding water then? Like if we're so safe and we keep hearing about this mega drought across the Southwest, should we be more generous? And Anyway, we got this this uh, email was fascinating. New new perspective was much needed. So we have this email from Catherine Bacon. She says, I'm an environmental engineer, water and wastewater specifically, and I currently live on the Western Slope. When it comes to the water conversation, I believe that the media tends to focus too much on the municipal water supply, despite the fact that municipal water consumption consistently accounts for only 20 to 30 percent of freshwater withdrawals in the U.S., We need to zoom out and have a much larger discussion that includes efficiency in agriculture irrigation, industrial water consumption, and our water rights system. Vast majority of our water goes to industry and ag. Considerably less is going to our homes and gardens. However, the conversation in the media tends to focus on how cities are using water and how we as users should decrease our individual water footprints, something that was noted during the segment. When it comes to municipal fresh water use, Las Vegas is a really inspiring example of how water can be conserved and growth can be facilitated at the municipal level. Since 2000, their population has grown by about 800,000 residents, but their total municipal water use has decreased. That is largely due to incentives for property owners to remove ornamental lawns and implement more efficient fixtures. They also did something similar to what Castle Rock is trying to do by banning turf front lawns from homes built after 2003. But when we zoom out and look at the full-scale freshwater use in Nevada, these savings aren't going to have remotely enough impact if most farmers continue using flood and sprinkler irrigation. The water is there. 
We can sustain growth in the West, but we need to truly overhaul the way we use water across the board. Frankly, I don't personally see that happening anytime soon. Fascinating. I mean, what a, what an interesting observation that most of the water use is for industry and agriculture. I mean, you made this point during our Pepsi episode, how much water is Pepsi using at their new mm -hmm. big bottling plant? But also like agriculture and industry, like those are, those support the people that live in cities. That's where most of the people are in the West. So it is like one big organism of a community that we are, which makes the local disputes over water, like the how different counties around Denver are, are handling it and, you know, developing rivalries over it. That seems even more meaningless the way our local politicians are fighting over it when it's like, for anybody who's thought about it, like Catherine, like the real, it seems like it should be a federal issue or maybe an even an international issue. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with her. I am curious, though. The Las Vegas comparison is fuzzy to me at best. Oh, yeah? Have you been to Las Vegas lately? There's water everywhere. They have a whole fake Venetian boating. You know what I mean? Like there's the the fountains. Like there's so much water being used by all these attractions. But she might be saying like there's still nothing compared to agriculture and larger industry. Um, again, this conversation reminds me of recycling. Growing up as a kid in the 90s, don't litter was everywhere. Recycling this, do that. It was all on the consumer and it was not on the the Pepsis of the world or what's the worst one? Nestle is also known for being like the worst water user mm -hmm. in the world. We don't talk about that. And she, she has an excellent point. Hmm. I agree. Yeah. I think Vegas, Vegas and water, it's, it's hard one to square because I think they're kind of like Denver where they had really like, you know, they built the Hoover dam. They, they have these reservoirs. They have a lot of access to water and senior water rights, but they've also been like really efficient in planning for this future that we're now in. Yeah. It's like they have water police. Can you imagine that in Denver? A water no. cop coming to your house and saying, turn off the faucet? I would, no, it's crazy to me. Okay, well, that's been our first ever specifically devoted to your feedback. This is our first official mailbag episode. I loved it so much. I loved hearing from everybody. Thank you all who wrote in. Um, keep writing in, even if we didn't share your feedback. We also, we hear it, we talk about it, we discuss it. It does inform what we do with our future shows. So please feel free to continue to share feedback with us. Paul, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Bree. See you tomorrow. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell that barista at Thump about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See ya. Wow, I just changed the date to 2002, then 2011. It is 2022. <laughs>